Hey, everybody. Welcome to the return of my Banker Education Series webinar show. This is Eric Cook with WSI Digital Marketing and uh, been somewhat noticeably absent from the Banker Education Series as I look through some of my past episodes. I think one of the last shows that I had, we were actually talking about Pokemon Go, if that kind of dates things. Um, but that was a pretty hot issue, and uh, a lot of community banks took advantage of the Pokemon craze when it hit. Um, so we're going to talk today about something that I don't think is a passing fad. I do think it's something that is here to stay. The OCC has recently started talking a little bit about fintechs and whether or not they actually deserve their own charter. Um, I've been talking about a conference coming up next week in Chicago called Next to Money Chicago that I'm very excited to be attending. And most importantly for today, I've got my good friend JP Nichols, who I had the pleasure of spending some quality time with him and his family while I was in Seattle earlier this year. We're both instructors at the Pacific Coast Banking School out there at the University of Washington. And he teaches in the first week and I teach in the second week. And uh, we're kind of the resident geeks on staff between the two weeks there talking about uh, technology and emerging trends. And he gets FinTech and I get digital and, uh, and social media. Um, so we're kind of kindred spirits. And uh, I'm really excited that JP is able to join me for today's show. Um, so JP, welcome to the return of my Banker Education Series show. I'm so glad that you joined us. Well, thanks. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So before we jump in and get started, uh, as a reminder, today's show and all shows that uh, we do for the Banker Education Series are recorded and made available. So if you uh, would like to relive all of this FinTech goodness, you certainly can do so by just coming back to the BES page here and we'll make the link available. Um, and uh, if you're listening on a recording and you didn't catch us live, then welcome to the recording. Um, there's links in there, but I encourage you to learn all about JP Nichols and visit his website. And we'll also be talking quite a bit about the Next Money Chicago event because a lot of what's on the agenda for Next Money Chicago really rolls into what JP is going to talk about today as far as the evolution and the status and the state of fintech in the world of banking. So I'm going to go and make JP the presenter. So we'll assume GoToWebinar allows me to work our little magic here. And he can go ahead and share his screen. So JP's got some slides we're going to talk about um, fintech um, today. If you are joining us on the live show, and you would like to ask a question or clarification or want JP to go back and cover something, please feel free to use the chat functionality that's in your control panel, probably floating on the right-hand side of your monitor, and let us know. I'll keep an eye on that while JP does his presenting wizardry. And uh, when there's a break in uh, some of the slides, maybe we'll stop periodically and we'll ask a few questions. So with those housekeeping items out of the way, and uh, I'll kind of, uh, kind of, scale down my excitement because I'm really excited to hear this, but uh, I'll go ahead and put myself on mute and turn the microphone over to you, JP. So let's go ahead and get rolling. Okay. Are, are you able to see my screen? Okay. Is it full screen? I see the screen and then we see the little thumbnails on the left-hand side. So I don't know if we're supposed to see the thumbnails, but uh, we see the future of finance. Yeah, I'm trying to put it in um, slideshow mode. I don't know if that will transfer over to go to webinar or not, um, because I do Are you have using keynote uh, or PowerPoint here. Po yeah, Power PowerPoint. Yep. If uh, I think if you hit slideshow, um, the little icon right up above uh, slide templates and slide layouts, you may end up uh, needing to flip your screens. But right next to in that top row of icons there, there's a uh, slideshow. Yeah. There we go. I, uh, uh, you're, seeing, you're seeing it in slideshow mode now? Uh, I'm seeing a black screen now, unfortunately. <laughs> so maybe, maybe PowerPoint just doesn't want it to behave for us. So, yeah. Well, so, let's go back into preview mode. and uh, Okay. Well, we'll, I'll just, we'll just do, this. do that. Perfect. I'll just do this. I've got a few uh, animations, but nothing that will uh, kill us here. So, okay. Well, gotcha. thank you cool. for having me here. And I'm excited, as always, to talk about fintech 
And I too am excited for next week, the Next Money Conference. Our themes for Next Money Chicago are capabilities, compliance, and collaboration, three things that we think are really shaping the future of finance. A friend of mine emailed me and said, you know, you forgot to see the customer. And I think that's a really, really good point. It was kind of implied and embedded here, but none of these things matter if we're not taking good care of our customer. So I spent 20 years helping to grow a $6 billion bank into a $400 billion uh, national, really global leader. And in the past five years, I've really been working at the edge, kind of the intersection of traditional financial services and fintech. We have a company called Fintech Forge, where we help financial institutions build and execute on their own innovation capacity. And we have a public organization we call Next Money. We originally started in the US as the Bank Innovators Council. We merged with our friends at what was then known as Next Bank, uh, formed in Singapore. And uh, we've combined that into Next Money, which is really a, a global institution. We're uh, a global community dedicated to reinventing finance through design, innovation, and entrepreneurship. We've done events on uh, six continents. And as you said, we've got an event coming up in Chicago next week on the 26th, so a week from today. We've got events in Melbourne, Singapore, and Hong Kong uh, following after that. And uh, certainly hope that those of you that are with us today or listening to the recording will join us as well. It's going to be a great lineup and a great day. Well, let me um, talk a little bit about what we're seeing that happening in the space. And it makes me think of uh, this quote attributed to Peter Drucker, and that is that uh, culture eats strategy for lunch. And when I think about this, I, I sometimes have thought about this meaning, oh, that's good because I'm really focused on building a good culture, and so my strategy won't matter. And I don't think that's exactly what Drucker meant. But I think what he definitely means is it doesn't matter how good your strategy is if your culture isn't aligned to support it, because your culture will um, eat up any strategies that you have for lunch and spit it out afterwards if you don't have the people and the process and the culture align. And I think this is a timely quote today because this is what we're seeing in the industry, all these people chasing shiny objects and uh, talking about cool technologies and even partnering and acquiring with fintech companies, but none of it matters unless we're really ready for it. So I want to kind of talk about each of these themes today, but think about this as an overarching theme because your strategy works until it doesn't. So this is an executive uh, said, we're strategically positioned better than just about anybody out there. Never in my wildest dreams would have, I have aimed this high. Well, maybe a little higher would have been good because of course, this was Blockbuster's head of digital strategy in, in 2010. Now, it's easy to pick on Blockbuster with benefit of 2020 hindsight, but this was not just a good company. This was really a great company. If we take a step back and think about what the video industry was like prior to Blockbuster, we had these mom and pop shops, a couple of hundred square feet, a couple of hundred titles in these small neighborhood shops. It was difficult to get the ones you wanted first choice. You rush in after work at 5.30 on a Friday and you're hoping to rent Beverly Hills Cop and instead you walk out with Camp Beverly Hills because it was really expensive to have a lot of inventory. These, these tapes cost $60, $70, $80. And what Blockbuster really put into place was some industry best practices that amounted to executing the business model better than everybody else. So there was a predominant business model that was based on having physical stores in prime locations and nobody had more prime locations than Blockbuster. They were opening you know, thousands of stores a year. They had about 30% of the market share at one point. They had 10,000 uh, square foot stores with thousands of titles. They used barcodes to manage their inventory through regional warehouses so that um, they did stock the most important movies for your neighborhood uh, in stock in your store, and they were able to match supply and demand across multiple stores through the regional warehouses. So again, what they really did was executed the primary model of the industry 
better than anybody else until it didn't work anymore. The apocryphal story goes that in 1997, an engineer in California named Reed Hastings supposedly rented a copy of Apollo 13, returned it back a few days later, had a $35, $40 late fee, and was kind of not happy about that. So he decided to do something about it, which was start his own company. And you all know how the story ends from here. Although a lot of people don't realize a few years later, Reed actually offered to sell Netflix to Blockbuster for $50 million and Blockbuster declined. They didn't really see the need for this. And if you think about Netflix and their original business model, it's not that hard to understand. Think about being on the board of Blockbuster when you hear about this upstart that comes to town and you hear, oh, they mail you a DVD and you go online and register. And when you're done, you mail that DVD back and they'll mail you another one. And if you're running these well-stocked 10,000 square foot stores with well-trained staff, remember, they, their staff were really human recommendation engine. Oh, you like this movie? Well, you might like this one. It's directed by the same director and so on. And they really believed in the power of personal service and the power of location, location, location for their physical uh, retail. And of course, that was the predominant model for a while. But with the kind of cost advantage that Netflix has, they were able to reinvest that and really be first to the punch for digital streaming. And of course, now Netflix is uh, the 800 pound gorilla and they're more than just a video rental distribution. They really are a platform. They've got original programming. They're uh, first to market with a lot of uh, the things that are their com- movies that are that are coming out um, after they've been in the first run theaters. So um, they've they've really gone beyond just mailing DVDs back and forth. And we'll talk about their platform strategy in a minute. But as recently as 2008, then Blockbuster CEO Jim Key says, you know, neither Redbox nor Netflix are even on the radar screen in terms of competition. So it doesn't matter how good your strategy is, if the game gets changed. And that's the thing about Netflix is they didn't beat them at their own game. They changed the game. So survey in 2014 for banks said, how do you measure convenience? And the number one answer as it had been every year, I can recall seeing one of these surveys was branches near me. In 2015 survey noticed a tipping point. It wasn't the number one answer anymore. Wasn't even the number two answer. It was number three answer. And number one became having a leading online and mobile offering. So we can see this coming. We see this tipping point already now, two, almost three years ago in 2015, when our own customers tell us that location, 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 and that well-trained staff, not saying that the value is zero, but it's not the number one driver of the way that the banks see convenience. And we should have seen this coming. We've seen the rise in smartphone now 10 years since the launch of the first iPhone, eight and 10 adults carrying not only a cell phone, but a smartphone, and it's continuing to rise. We've seen the percentage of transactions taking place on mobile increase, and also in 2015, for the first time, actually exceeding the number of transactions that took place in the branch. And in the fourth quarter, Bank of America announced some pretty interesting stats, monthly active users uh, 21 million at the end of the fourth quarter and continuing to rise. And the gray bar through those uh, blue bars on the left is the percent of total deposit transactions that take place on mobile, growing every single quarter that more and more people are making those deposits on their phone, not in the branch. So if you believe that, well, we need to be there because that's where the customers are. Well, the customers are increasingly turning to their phones. So what this means is the weekly mobile interactions that Bank of America is seeing is 12 times that of the weekly branch interactions. The Economist reported this summer that U.S. banks have closed over 10,000 branches since the start of the financial crisis. Bank of America being certainly in the lead, but not alone in that as more and more people are realizing the customer's preferences are changing, the customer's behaviors are changing, and we have to pay attention to that too. So what's the driver of that? 
well, certainly technology and capabilities. As William Gibson said about the future, I say about disruption, it's already here. It's just not widely distributed yet. Most of what we have seen has really been at the experience level. These are the things that are really touching your customer directly. Things like putting an iPad in your advisor's hands, uh, updating your website and your mobile app and so on. Most of the activity has really been there and for good reason because of the statistics that we just saw. But I'm telling you that we're still in the very early stages of seeing things at the tactical level. This is where things like APIs, application programming interfaces, which we're gonna talk about in a moment, things like straight through processing and process reengineering, the digital connective tissue that's connecting those experiences to a more and more increasingly digital core and connecting at the deepest level where we're really just scratching the surface today in things like blockchain and artificial intelligence and not only change the way we do today's activities, but are actually creating complete new business models and, and massive change for the industry. So APIs, application program interface, been around for a long time. It's really just a fancy way of saying it allows uh, multiple computer systems to interact in, in limited and defined ways with others. A common one is to think about Google Maps. So think about whether you're on Yelp or any number of apps uh, and you want to map your way to the restaurant or the place that you found and it connects automatically to the Google Maps API. So Google is exposing certain pieces of that data for others to use and build on. And the value is really that of the network effect. So you have more users using this data so it's more valuable for Google and it's more valuable for the other app makers. Well, we're seeing banks beginning to pay attention to this too in um, quite a big way. So today, much of the bank infrastructure reminds me of computers in the 1980s and the 1990s. We have all of these different kind of plugs and adapters and dongles that are needed, but increasingly it is changing over to APIs. This is being driven by legislation in Europe European Commission launched uh, what uh, PSD, the Personal uh, uh, Payment Service Directive, and the second version of that that is uh, was proposed in 2013, approved in 2015, and is in the process now and through next year of being localized, meaning that all of the countries in Europe are defining their own specific goals. We're seeing a similar uh, work being done in New Zealand and Australia. I was just in New Zealand with uh, Aussie and Kiwi banks a couple of months ago talking about this. But if we look at this in terms of a broader timeline, we'll see this is really 20 years in the making. Where companies like Quicken and Yodley uh, work together on things like the Open Financial Exchange so that standards were set. And this was really the first time where we began to electronify consumer transaction records and commercial transaction records and we didn't really do much with it, but our customers had needs. So companies like Quicken and Yodely came around and said, well, if we can get that data, we can aggregate that data, manipulate, manipulate it and move it around and we can create charts and we can give you reports and all of this kind of stuff. And then that really accelerated uh, as we got closer to uh, the financial crisis. And after and during the financial crisis, complete applications came up. Companies like Perk Street Financial and Simple and Fedor and Movin, these companies that really we'd call today uh, neo banks or digital banks that said, well, if we have access to that data and each one of them has kind of a different pedigree, but this notion that this data is important, it has value for our customers, they want access to it. And by and large, the banks have done very little with it. So this commercial response that we've seen all around the world was also mirrored on the lower part of the screen here, you see by a governmental response in Europe, where the European Banking Industry Commission 2009 made the first moves of the kind of predecessors of what would become PSD2 today, and meaning that now in Europe, the banks have to provide certain pieces of data available via API, via standard data calls, so that the customers have access through that 
themselves or through other apps. And this also means that app builders and uh, technologists of fintech companies have access to this data given customer permission to be able to build other experiences around it. So where that's evolved there in kind of the upper right hand quadrant of that is the banks are really creating essentially app stores. Uh, the Dev Exchange at Capital One, the first really was created at Agricole and, and their CA store. Uh, but we're seeing this really all of the major banks are responding to this. Now, a lot of community banks are not paying attention to this. Some are, a few. But I think over time, this is a trend you're going to have to keep your eye on because this is going to really open up the gap between what your customers are coming to expect and what we're currently providing. You think about the rise of the smartphone, which we looked at already. You couldn't imagine today having a smartphone that you didn't have the freedom of downloading literally millions of apps for. If it came only with a couple of things preloaded from the phone manufacturer, it wouldn't be what we have today. And I think what we're headed towards, clearly what we're headed towards, is a future where you're going to think the same thing about your bank. How do we have access to all of these things around our financial data, not just what the bank gives me uh, permission to do today? So it's beginning to open up quite a bit. So what this means is we're moving from pipes to platforms. We talked about Netflix being a platform. It's not just having pipes to distribute our own products that we manufacture, but platforms really where makers and users are coming together and in many cases co-creating. You look at the largest companies in the world in 2006 and 2011, you have one tech company uh, amidst a bunch of energy companies and a couple of banks. And in 2011, Mark Andreessen the creator of the Netscape, Netscape uh, web browser wrote an important op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal where he said software is eating the world. And it didn't seem maybe exactly true in 2011, but just five years later, now look, the top five companies, the largest companies in the world, all not only are they technology companies, software-based companies, but they're all platforms. So they're bringing together makers and users and doing more than just selling their own products. So platforms are here to stay, technology is here to stay. And this $60 billion that's been bandied about, this is the amount of capital investment in fintech companies over the past four years. That's really just the tip of the iceberg because think about the encroachment from adjacent players like Walmart, Amazon, Facebook, and others. These are well-funded companies from adjacent industries they're getting into financial services and technology is a driver of that. But also think of the new strategies, the acquisitions, the aqua hires by the incumbents, the digital arms race by your largest competitors, the Citibank, Capital One, BBVA, and many, many others, just to name a couple. Uh, FinTech is driving this as well. Build by our partner? Well, increasingly the answer is yes. The leading financial, financial institutions of the world are doing all the above. They're empowering others while they're building their own. And they're also um, incubating uh, small companies and investing in them and acquiring in them. So all this leads me to think about this word innovation. It gets thrown out a lot and I think it's often misused. So I like to ask and as Eric talked about, I teach a class on this at Pacific Coast Banking School and a couple of other of the leading graduate schools of banking. And I ask, what is innovation? And the definition that I like to use is this. Innovation is implementing new ideas that create value. Now, most people get the new ideas part, but the implementation part is important. Just having a good idea isn't enough. You need to implement it. And the ideas you implement need to create value. What we see from a lot of institutions is what I like to call innovation theater. We have a lot of great shiny objects running around. We have staffs full of uh, wearing hoodies and sneakers in uh, brick lined, uh, brick walled offices downtown. Isn't that cool? Well, it might be if it actually leads to something. Otherwise, it's just innovation theater. Well, I guess at least even innovation theater is somewhat progress because most of us have been kind of at the opposite end of that where we've been surrounded by what I like to call the business prevention department. Don't worry, somebody came in here with a good idea, but I got rid of them. 
And that's kind of the nature of financial services. We're risk averse. And so things that are new and unproven and untested seem scary and risky, but increasingly the industry has been about, well, what about the risk of not taking risk? So we have to innovate, but we want to innovate things that are going to actually create value. And what we really want is the best of both worlds. We want to maintain our risk management profile. We don't want to put our shareholders, our depositors, our regulators in harm's way. But at the same time, we can't just keep doing what we used to do and hope that will continue to work forever because it won't. And it's clearly already not. So what we want is the best of both worlds. You know, the Japanese samurai sword is made with a process the Japanese called tamahagane. It's a mixture of high carbon steel that's very, very strong and a lower carbon steel that's very flexible. And that's really what we want to have in our institutions is balancing that strength with flexibility. Because managing innovation is very, very different than managing the core business. You know, these pictures you can see kind of faded in the background here. I often talk about, I call them uh, trailblazers and traditionalists and uh, the old guy on the right that looks like most of us in the industry, um, that's exactly who I want running the audit committee and, and managing the credit risk of the loan book. But I'm not so sure I want to give him the keys of the future either. And then the person on the left, and maybe just the opposite. I'm not so sure I, I want him uh, you know, running the audit committee, but I definitely want to test new things, new products, new customers, new markets, and discover next practices, not just enforce best practices. So this is difficult for financial institutions because we're really good at managing our core business. But what happens when that isn't good enough anymore when the game changes beneath our feet? Well, we've got to innovate and create new sources of value. And this notion of plan your work and work your plan, well, it really doesn't work anymore, at least not in this dynamic environment, this era of digital disruption that we're in right now. As the great Prussian military strategist Helmuth von Moltke says, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. I think that the great orator Mike Tyson says it maybe even a little more succinctly. Everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. And the notion is this. It's not that we shouldn't plan, but just understanding we can't plan it all out up front. And managing innovation is not like managing an IT project, or at least not a traditional IT project where the outcome is fairly well understood and we're managing towards that outcome. A part of what innovation is, is really discovery. So traditional product development looks something like this. And this is what we do inside our financial institutions. We have a business plan and requirements and we talk to people, hey, we're going to launch this new app or this new product. Let's get requirements from everybody and then we build it and then we test it. And then we launch it. And if we were all in the same room here, I'd ask for a show of hands, how many people have gone through this process and had a project that launched and didn't meet your expectations and probably about every hand in the room would go up because we've all had this experience. And then the finger pointing kind of starts, well, you know, marketing didn't support this in the right way. Well, we didn't sell it the way we should have. Well, it's finance's fault because they're the ones that made us project that kind of sales and that, that was never realistic. When I'm in those meetings, what I tend to do is wait till all of that dies down and raise my hand and quietly ask, did anybody talk to a customer along the way? And frequently the answer is no. We really aren't involving the customer until later on that we think that we can put all of our smartest people around a big brown conference table and think about all of the contingencies, all of the changes that'll happen in the competitive environment and the technology environment. We'll be able to understand and reconcile all of those things up front. And the reality is we rarely can. Coming out of the dot-com bust in the early 2000s, um, Steve Blank really became uh, quite a guru. He teaches at the MBA program at Stanford and at Columbia and at Cal. And he has a great phrase that says, the facts lie outside the building. And that's true. It's not inside, no matter how many smart people we crowd around that brown conference table. He wrote a great book called Four Steps of the Epiphany, and he talks about this. And he was really the father of the lean startup movement. But he really talks about instead of product development, customer development. And the first phase is really about exploration. 
you know, turning hypotheses into facts and then identifying scalable and repeatable sales models. So this iterative loops of customer discovery and customer validation, you know, sometimes this is known shorthand as nail it, then scale it. We have to nail it before we scale it. It's not build it and they will come. It's let's figure out, are we really solving a problem our customers care about? Or as I read on Twitter at a Finnovate demo one time, they're solving a problem nobody cares about with technology nobody wants. That's the last kind of description you ever want to have. Then after you're done with the exploration, you've really nailed it. Now it's time to execute and to scale it. One of his, uh, Steve Blank's acolytes was Eric Ries, who wrote a famous book some of you may have read called The Lean Startup. And he talks about this iterative loop in terms of ideas, product and data, build, measure, learn. So build something, test it, measure the results, learn from that and iterate and go through the cycle many, many times. The faster and the more times you can go through the cycle, the better your product is because you're actually getting real data from the marketplace, not around those people around the big brown conference table. And so what we've done at FinTech Forge is really taken the best of these customer development, lean startup and lean Six Sigma and put them in a wrapper that is relevant for financial services that includes risk management, compliance, infrastructure, culture, and core processes. And we call it FIRE, which stands for fast, iterative, responsive experiments. I don't have time to go into all of it today, but I'll give you just kind of a, a, a quick headline or two for things that might be useful for you as you think about this changing environment we're in and how do we move from trying to plan it all up front to being much faster, meaning we shorten the gap between idea and learning. We need to make sure it's iterative, which is the process of continuous improvement. Responsive, meaning that data is going to drive our iterations, not opinions. The uh, I, I talked about Netscape, the CEO um, who, who was there at the same time as, as Mark Andreessen uh, has, has a great quote to James Barkdale, Barksdale. And he says, if we're going to go with data, let's use data. If we're going to go with opinions, let's use mine. So certainly much better if we can use data. And finally, we want to run as many as experiments as possible. The experiment should be structured so that we maximize learning. We're not trying to prove something. We're trying to test something. And if we're proven right, great. If we're proven wrong, that's okay too, because now we know that doesn't work. And let's move on to the next thing. As Thomas Edison said, I haven't failed. I found 10,000 ways it won't work. That gets me closer to a way that it will. And all of this is just another way of framing up a test and learn culture. Remember, we started this talking about culture, eat strategy for lunch, and this has to be embedded in our culture, this idea of test and learn. We wouldn't sit down at a poker table and push all of our chips in and say, now deal me some cards. I sure hope they're good ones. So instead, we would bet the minimum, see how the cards play out, see how we're doing. If they look really good, we'll increase our bet. If they don't, we'll fold and wait to the next one. And that's something we typically haven't been very good at in our industry because what we're really trying to do is find the sweet spot between viability, desirability, and feasibility. Is it viable as a business? Do people actually want it? And can we build it? Is it technologically feasible? We can sometimes test one of those things. We can test all of those things. And ultimately, we do need to test all of them to make sure it's really right but we can run a series of trials inside our organization to test each one of those independently. But before we launch, we really need to be able to test all of those things. Well, lastly, let me talk a little bit today, and I, I, I definitely want to leave some time for Q&A. So if you, you have any, um, uh, please uh, let Eric know. I'm, I'm more than happy to make this as interactive as we can. But I want to talk last today about collaboration. It's one of the three themes that we're going to talk about at Next Money Chicago next week. You know, traditionally, we have framed this up about being incumbents versus insurgents. And I joke that that sounds like a great title for a BBC series. I hope it's coming this fall. But if you think about this is the way we've talked about fintech for nearly a decade, that we're inside our thick castle walls surrounded by deep moats. And our instincts is just to make the walls thicker and the moats deeper. And this notion of how do we repel the insurgents? And if that's the way you frame it, then the question becomes this, can incumbents innovate faster than insurgents can reach scale? 
I don't think that's the right way to frame it anymore. I used to go to Finnovate and hear these insurgents talking about putting you incumbents out of business. And increasingly, they're really on stage saying, hey, we want to partner with you. You have customers and you have data on those customers. You have valuable data. You know what they own, what they owe, what comes in, what goes out, when it goes, where it goes. But let's be honest, we've done very little with it. You know, going back to the days of the mid 90s and, and Quicken and others building um, utilities around that data that we've done very little with. 20 years later, we haven't done a whole lot more in most cases. And so how do we partner with others? And, you know, if Jamie Dimon, the chairman of one of the largest and most successful financial institutions on the planet, says we're looking at fintechs, they're very good at certain things, and we're completely comfortable partnering where it makes sense. Well, you know, maybe the rest of us should too. Because consumers trust banks and they trust fintechs too. 96% of 14,000 consumers globally surveyed by, surveyed by Capgemini and EFMA said that they trust their bank completely or somewhat. I think most people were surprised to say that number was 90% for fintechs. And you can see that it's more in the somewhat range than the completely, but that's still a gap that's much narrower than most bankers believe it would be. And they also asked these same consumers, well, would you refer your friends and family to your bank? About half said yes, and nearly two thirds said they would refer their FinTech. They get a better customer experience, more responsive, faster, and the really experience is good. So this opportunity to collaborate and work well together, I think is absolutely the future of finance. Now, I sometimes hear this, we already partner we have some tech vendors and we have a procurement department, which I say that is really not partnering. As Ron Shevlin from Cornerstone Advisors likes to say, you know, your procurement department is not drafting partnership agreements. They're drafting contracts that they're holding vendors accountable for. Now, vendor risk management is absolutely important, but if we're really going to partner and get the best of both worlds in this era of digital disruption, we've got to think a little bit beyond, you know, holding proverbial three people in a garage, uh, asking them to indemnify our multi-billion dollar institution. We've got to think through this a little bit differently. But bankers are from Mars and fintechs are from Venus. You guys are from different planets. You speak a different language. Yes, the technology needs to work. Tab A needs to fit into slot B. But that's not usually the hardest part. The hardest part is making sure that the culture the cost and the compliance works. This is the third C that we're gonna talk about next week, compliance. How do we balance compliance with creativity? Because this move fast and break things eco ethos of Silicon Valley doesn't work in our highly regulated environment. We've gotta stay compliant, even though we're testing and learning, and that's a difficult thing. That's why we put together the FIRE process. So. A couple of closing thoughts here. I'll, I'll leave you with this kind of Pascal's dilemma. And the first is the, uh, the, the vertical axis. Do you buy all the stuff I just told you that we're in a new landscape? Or do you think the old world order ultimately prevails? And then you have to decide, are you going to do something about it or not? Because you could hope this is all a temporary fad. You could double down on your existing strategies. You could just give up and give way to fintech innovators. I've heard a lot of community banks have been doing that on the consumer side and doubling down on their existing strategies for commercial. And we're just getting started in fintech in commercial. So there's a lot more to come there. But ultimately, I believe the best course of action is to embrace, engage, and partner with these new players. Because ultimately, this is a part of your job as a leader. And I'll close uh, as we opened with a Peter Drucker quote. You know, Peter famously said, management is doing things right, but leadership is doing the right things. And I think that your role as a leader, one of the most important things for you to decide on is the allocation of resources, financial resources, human resources, managerial time and attention. You decide what you're gonna pay attention to and what you're going to ignore. And as the game is changing beneath our feet, it's our leadership challenge to figure this out and make sure that we're not only doing things right, but we're doing the right things. So uh, with that, I'll remind you again uh, next week, 
Next Money Chicago on the 26th. Love to see you there. And um, we still have some tickets left as of this morning. And I'm happy to take uh, any questions that you might have. Awesome. Um, just a little plug, JP has been very kind in allowing me to use a coupon code for any of my connections, and I'll pass that along to those of you that are listening. So if you visit that nextmoney.org link there at the bottom, which shy 17 is the prefix, that'll take you directly to the registration page. Eric25 will save you 25% off your registration cost. So thank you, JP and the Next Money crew. I'm excited. I got my registration in yesterday and uh, I booked my hotel and looking forward to spending a few days with you and the rest of the crew. So um, as a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question or have any kind of food for thought, feel free to use the chat functionality. Um, I do while we're waiting to see if anybody else has got a question. You made the comment um, when you were talking about um, Netflix interested in selling to Blockbuster and yes. how they said, yeah, we're not interested. Um, I've heard an urban legend. I don't know if it's true or maybe you've heard it or maybe you can debunk it. But I had heard that Uber, which is also kind of seen as an innovator and a disruptor, made an attempt to sell its business in the early days to the San Francisco taxi company. And they scoffed their nose at Uber and said, that's not part of our business model. You're going to fail. And now the San Francisco Yellow Taxi Company is basically filed for bankruptcy. And we kind of know how that whole story has evolved. So first off, have you heard that? Is that true? Or am I falling victim to an urban religion that I uh, uncovered someplace? Um, well well, I don't know if the, if they tried to sell themselves uh, to the taxi authority or not. I, I haven't heard that, but what uh, I, you're certainly right on the second part. It, it is a fact that the Yellow Taxi Company of San Francisco has filed for bankruptcy protection. I can also tell you a fact that the value of taxi medallions has plummeted. I work with some financial institutions who use them uh, as collateral, who lend money to uh, taxi drivers and the value of that collateral has uh, plummeted. And I, and I can also tell you that, you know, this whole test and learn thing that we talked about, I share in class a little bit of the Uber case study on how they uh, originally called themselves Uber Cab. And that was um, exactly what they were doing is they were trying to solve a problem that cab customers had that the taxi companies weren't really very interested in solving. And that was kind of the ride experience of not needing cash and being able to go anywhere from point A to point B and being able to hail one without going to the curb and raising their hand or, you know, trying to call a dispatcher and all of that stuff. So clearly Uber has been a, a massively disruptive force to the, uh, the original players in, in the, the, the taxi companies in, in many cities. Yeah. Not, not without its own recent soap operas, the CEO departed and all that other uh, fun stuff going on in the world of Uber. But suffice to say, people don't think of transportation the same, whether it's Uber or Lyft or any of the other ride sharing services now that they've entered the entered the playing field. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, they're uh, they've got a fairly toxic culture. They're trying to work their way through now. And I and I hope that they do. Um, yep. And, and, and it's a shame because they were a great innovator. Yeah. So along those lines, though, you've got companies that have come along, the incumbent has ignored them and then suffered the fate of extinction in most cases, or at least bankruptcy protection in others. Do you have any like crystal ball that you're looking into as you think of all the different fintechs that are out there and the different technologies and companies and solutions that are looking to fix the ways that society does their banking, whether it's blockchain technology, whether it's automated robot kind of intelligence based investing. Um, is there anything in the horizon that you would predict has the potential of being the next Uber to the taxi companies or the next Netflix to the blockbusters that we might want to put on a radar screen? Well, I'd start by saying I don't see, uh, as far as I can see into the future, which is, you know, probably about an hour, but, uh, I, <laughs> and I don't, I don't make a, a lot of predictions, but, but, but I will say this, I, I see, 
<clears throat> excuse me, I don't see a future without banks. Uh, I, I see banks still existing. And what I often say to audiences is, but don't take undue solace in that because that doesn't mean your bank is going to survive. Right? I think some banks and, and the largest and most well-funded, it's not an accident how they have accrued more and more market share. You know, the top 10 banks have something like what, 80% of the assets, 60% of the deposits. Yes, part of that was um, M&A activity, um, particularly during and, and after the crisis, but also they have invested in technology that is relevant for customers. So they're continuing to retain those customers. So I, I think that we'll continue to have consolidation in the banking industry, not down to zero, but there were 13,000 banks when I started in the industry in the late eighties, and we're down to about 5,000 banks and a slightly larger number of credit unions today. I, I do think that uh, things like blockchain and distributed ledger, ledger technologies are the things that can really change banking. We've used this term disintermediation for a long time. We've often used it wrong. We've said it when we meant uh, losing market share, or we've said it when we meant that one product might cannibalize the existing market share of another one. But disintermediation, the root of that word is intermediary. And that's what banks and, and credit unions are. We're an intermediary where we gather deposits and we make loans and we distribute liquidity and we also act as an intermediary between um, uh, unknown and untrusted third parties. And some of those things, the, the latter in particular, is exactly a solid use case for things like distributed ledger technology. Instead of each of us maintaining our own ledger and reconciling that, a distributed um, immutable ledger that will hold transactions now, Bitcoin was the first use case bid, uh, built on that, and I, I definitely won't talk about the speculation of Bitcoin. I, I don't understand speculating on it as, a, as an asset, but the technology uh, behind that that has a lot of use cases, I think is going to be a major, major change, and many banks see that. That's why there's so much money going into that and so many consortia that are focused on that. So uh, I'll also answer, maybe the answer what, what might be your next question, which is, you know, what, what do banks need to do? And it, it's just continuing to be relevant to your customers. And it's not about which technology is the coolest or the biggest or the most important. I think keeping an eye on that is important, but really, really understanding um, your customer needs and testing and learning and, and building things that are relevant for them is, is really the most important thing. Yeah. Well, and, and that was kind of my next question. I'm like, oh, if he nails this, that's going to be evidence that he does have a crystal ball, and I'm going to call him out on it. <laughs> but my, my, my question on this is, um, and at PCBS, um, that is a lot of very, very large banks. I mean, when I look at the number of assets that banks have that sit in the class, there's a lot of commas in that number, whereas some of the other schools that you and I teach at, much more community bank orientated. And for a community bank that is somewhat limited to their technology offering, or they may think they're limited by their technology offering based off of their core provider, well, we can only offer what Jack Henry supports, or we can only offer what Fiserv supports. As a community bank that wants to embrace FinTech and remain relevant, are there really partnership opportunities like that one slide that you had quoted um, where we're, we're open to do that? Or to what extent does a community bank experience somewhat of a handcuffed innovation cycle because of their reliance on third-party providers to build and, and serve the technology that runs their bank? Well, there are definitely constraints. All right. the, the three most common questions I get after I speak to a group is, you know, what about our regulators? Um, you know, what about... Um, our um, our own technology and and what about our core provider? Those things are absolutely constraints, but but they can be worked with. And yes, partnerships can be relevant for banks of any size. In fact, the great news is it has never been easier or cheaper to rent amazing technology. You used to have to build this stuff in house and have massive server farms or mainframe space and all of this stuff and, and banks have slowly gotten away from that where we're willing, you know, with the right, um, you know, risk management protocols around it and so on, we're, we're more willing to be able to um, partner with others to build things. And so there are many opportunities right now. 
And that's actually kind of probably the number one thing I do at FinTech Forge is we're actually bringing banks together. And I would add to this to things that they can't do alone, they can certainly do together with the right structure and the right framework around it. And so we're helping banks work together and figure out, well, what are the things that we need to improve upon and who are the partners that we can bring in? And how do we do that in a way that will work in our regulated environment and work in our technology environment? So I, I think there are definitely some options out there. Cool. Well, it's good to know that there's a, a future for the community bank in this space. So um, hopefully um, those that want to I don't know if they push the envelope, but embrace this and, and be a part of that. And there's simply going to be some community banks there in market areas where this concept of fintech, um, we have that conversation with clients all the time where, you know, the fintech to them is social media. You know, we're in predominantly a very rural area. We don't think we need to be tweeting or do we need to be worrying about all this social media stuff? Um so it doesn't mean that it has to be embraced by everybody. It needs to be right for your individual market area. So, yeah. cool. Yeah, I I would say that, you know, and, and I've met family-owned banks that really aren't that interested in growing. They just want to kind of preserve what they have, and that's okay. Uh, but if you're interested in growing, and if you're doubling down on a strategy that's relevant for a customer base that isn't embracing technology to the way we're seeing it in the large trends, that might be just fine. My only question there is for how long, right? If you're right today. Right, right. And, and, and I also think people kind of underestimate, well, well, you know, our customers wouldn't really want that. And when you actually talk to your customers, you find out they've actually got you know, four or five financial apps on their phone and they're already doing things outside of the bank but the bank <laughs> feels like they haven't heard about it. So, you know, their customers wouldn't be interested. Um, but, yeah, you know, good point. I, yeah, but I see some of these banks, their average customer is somewhere between age 67 and dead. And, you know, as that you know, market <laughs> is just dying off, literally, um, yep. you know, how, how are we going to replace that with, with um, younger generation? And I don't get too caught up in this talk about generation because I often tell stories about, you know, my 80 year old mom is fairly tech savvy, but um, it, you know, this, this notion of, well, our, if our customers don't want that, you, you might be right for now, but I think you still have to look at um, the overall trends. Sure. So good. Well, I think that that brings us to a close. Um, we've got a few minutes left, but there's no need to stretch it out if we don't have to. Um, I'll give you kind of the last word if you want to kind of mention anything else, if you want to flip over to next money and kind of share the schedule, um, I'll let you wrap it up. Oh, sure. So um, th thanks for having me here. It's al always a pleasure talking with you and and uh, with your audience. And uh, yep, I hope um, some of you can join us uh, next week in Chicago. We will open up with uh, a keynote around capabilities. Brett King, um, author of Bank 2.0, Bank 3.0, Breaking Banks, uh, host of the Breaking Banks podcast. And he's going to talk about, um, really, he's the one with the crystal ball, looking forward to some of uh, the ways that artificial technology, um, artificial intelligence and um, other kinds of augmented technology is, is changing all kinds of industries, including banking. And I mentioned uh, Ron Shevlin earlier. He's going to lead a great panel as we talk about all that and what he likes to call the platformification of banking. Um, you know, Sam Mall will be there, Dwayne Blomstrom. Uh, so some of the names, if you Google FinTech leaders, uh, most of the names that'll show up on any one of those lists are gonna be here with us next week. So I, I hope you will be too. Yeah, I'm gonna try really, really hard not to walk out uh, around in the lobby and, and whatnot with my jaw like wide open and make it look like I'm overly starstruck. So if you uh, if you see me looking like that, just come up and gently close my mouth because uh, I'm looking forward to seeing some of these folks and meeting them in person. This is going to be a great event. It'll, it'll be a great group. Yeah, cool. Good. Well, that's a wrap on uh, this issue or issue, this episode of Banker Education Series. Thanks, JP Nichols, for joining us and sharing all of your awesome insight. Uh, around the area of fintech. Uh, I do hope that some of you that are listening either live or can catch the recording will be able to join us in Chicago next week. If you do, 
come up and say hi. Um, those of you that I'm connected with in social media know that uh, I'm not afraid of a selfie. As uh, JP knows, I think I've got a couple of those from the Starbucks uh, roastery <laughs> out in Seattle with us. Uh, and so it'd be kind of fun to get a picture together and uh, just kind of hang out for the event. So I'm really looking forward to it. So thanks for joining me. And uh, we'll be back uh, at some point down the road with the next episode of our Banker Education Series. But until then, appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen. And uh, we'll see you out there online. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.